Welcome to the 20th Ubud Writers and Readers Festival. Ooh. Big round of applause Ooh. for Janet and me. For each other, for ourselves. Emeritus Professor Jim Bendel. Um, we're all here to celebrate the launch of Breaking Together, a freedom loving response to class. And I'm going to introduce Jim. We're going to chat for about 40 minutes and then we'll have plenty of time uh, for audience Q&A. Um, and we're actually, uh, I said this before, but for, for those people who just arrived, we're actually going to do an a extended director's cut edition. And so we're going to blow right past 6 o'clock and go to about 6.30. So if you, if you can stick around, stick around. Um, if you need to leave at 6, that's fine. Just kind of quietly slip out. But um, so there'll be a lot of time for audience questions and answer. And then what we also want to do near the end is spend a few minutes just um, sitting with our, our feelings and processing all of the stuff because this, this collapse stuff can be pretty intense and it can bring up some big emotions so we want to sort of like honour that and integrate that. Um, so I'm going to just uh, introduce Jim and then we'll dive into it. So Jim Bendel is a world-renowned scholar on the breakdown of modern society due to environmental change. He has just retired from the University of Hungary in England where he was a full professor. He's perhaps most well known for his 2018 paper on deep adaptation which has been downloaded over a million times, has launched a social movement in the deep adaptation of forums, and was highly influential in the establishment and the growth of the worldwide Extinction Rebellion movement. Um, in a past life, Jim was a self-described day boss of dropout. But most importantly, and definitely most importantly for today, um, he is the author of Breaking Together, which is the fruit of three furious years of work with an interdisciplinary team of scholars and as an update to the deep adaptation thesis, which, to devolutively summarise, could be described as societal collapse is imminent and inevitable, which is now updated to societal collapse has already begun and there's no way out of it. Um, but yeah, before I jump into the questions, uh, Jim, do you have any uh, opening statements for the audience? Yeah, I'm honoured so many of you have, have come uh, for such a tough topic, so you're, I, re I just want to say that before we dive in, you know, you, you've given up a glorious afternoon in Bali, near the end of the world, to uh, come and talk about, about these things, and so, so lots of respect to you. Thank you for coming. Well, so, should we, should we um, have the fan for the sake of recording as well? For now, yeah. Yeah, is, is that okay? Could I um, just turn that? So just stay hydrated, people. <laughs> All right, so maybe, um, maybe let's begin at the beginning, right? So before there was Breaking Together, there was a, a little paper you wrote called uh, Deep Adaptation, a Map for Navigating Climate Tragedy. Um, and when you wrote it, I don't think you expected it to go the way that it did. Um, but do you want to maybe take us back to that uh, origin story of why you wrote it, how it went, what your response to it was, and what, what brought you to writing this new book? Yeah, so I've been an environmentalist since I was 15 years old. And so then that influenced what I studied at university. And so it meant that when I started to see news coming in about like 30 degrees in the Arctic Circle in the summer, or forest fires in the tundra, or the melting of permafrost, I thought these were the kind of scenarios that we were speculating on back in the 90s about what might happen and if I lived into my 80s I might get to see some of this beginning and at that point people might actually realize that climate change, man-made climate change is happening and it's a problem. So that was the way we kind of thought in the 90s. I was seeing all that, uh, I was paying attention to the climate news uh, 2013, 2014, I really started to worry and so by 2017, I took a year out of university, unpaid leave, to actually study the climate science for myself. And I realized that my conclusion was my whole career working in corporate sustainability was based on a, on a false premise that we had time in order to transition the current way of life into a more sustainable way of life. Um, and I, yeah, and so then I, I um, put that together in a paper. It was a bit of a a howl, of, a scream of pain, that paper. And I did it to make sure I couldn't go back to my old job. I was deliberately burning bridges with the whole field of corporate sustainability and saying, guys, we've been lying to ourselves. We have to prepare for massive disruption and we have to accept that an expansionist monetary system, an expansionist 
economy and an industrial consumer way of life, none of that can continue within this, these, these constraints, these ecological constraints. And yeah, I was surprised how it, how it took off. So it, well, it ended up being something that only people in my field read, but it became a bit of a phenomenon, including amongst people who hadn't even thought about climate change before. So you had people like bankers in London who read it and then decided to quit their job and become full-time activists in Extinction Rebellion. So it was quite an, it was a very unusual response. And also, I didn't think that, it didn't occur to me but once you realize that modern industrial consumer societies are gonna crumble, that you decide to go out and glue yourself to a pavement to get arrested, that, that hadn't occurred to me um, yes. as a response. <laughs> no, I hadn't occurred, but suddenly people were responding in that way, and I, you know, I thought, well, okay, you better try something. <laughs> and so then, um, what inspired you to write this, this much larger, longer, um, and we could say Gleeker? What, what, when did that start? Because you've been at it for it's about three years now. Yeah, I talk about it in the book. So basically, it's about um, two years after the deep adaptation paper took off, and therefore Extinction Rebellion took off, and also the deep adaptation movement took off, which basically means for people who anticipate the breakdown of societies as we know them, who want to actually approach that in a curious, kind, creative way rather than just saying, where's my gun, where's my tin of baked beans, help me build a bunker. You know, people who wanted to be their best selves in the face of a crisis. That was the deep adaptation ethos and movement. But I am, um, yeah, come July 2020, there was a very coordinated backlash involving some of the most famous climatologists, famous environmental journalists, who decided to try and cancel this topic, cancel the idea that collapse is a possibility, that there's a plausible case to be made, that we should actually look at it and think what to do about it, cancel deep adaptation as a paper, cancel me as, a, as an academic. And um, I had never experienced that before, so I didn't really know what to do about it. I was advised to do nothing about it. Looking back, I'm not sure, because what's online stays online forever. Um, but yeah, I was very close to the founders of Extinction Rebellion, and one of them said, Jem, her quote was, Jem, you need to get on the front foot. You need to... You could just go off and live and strum guitar and meditate and, and learn and teach Buddhism and all those things you've been talking about to me, Jem, but... There aren't that many people who have your following and have your skill set and could actually explore and possibly augment your understanding of what's happening in the world, environmentally, socially, economically, politically. So she's like, get on the front foot. I, I, and so I, yeah, I ended up responding to a Danish foundation that said that they would fund me to put a research team together in order to actually help scholars speak out. So we would do training courses and we would research, do research reports. And the stupid thing I said in the application form at the end, oh, well, I'll write a book. <laughs> so it's probably like, you know, one pound an hour in terms of the reality of getting this book done. Yeah. And so when you actually got stuck into the research with, with you and your team, um, I think it might be fair to say it was worse than you thought. But um, can you, I mean, you can tell us maybe the broad brush story to what you discovered, but it's a, it's a 500 page book with 70 pages of footnotes. So if you need the full story, buy a copy with a lot of solvent and plenty of silver, yeah. But yeah, were there any like particular um, findings that were particularly shocking or disturbing, um, especially in terms of being more far gone than you thought might be? Well, two things have come to mind. So the first half of the book is, is an integrative analysis from a whole range of scholarly disciplines on what's crumbling in our modern industrial consumer life. The second half of the book is what to do about it and what not to do about it. But yeah, when, you, when I, what stands out for me? Okay, um, three things. Um, the first is, I didn't realize how eco-modern I was. I didn't realize 
that I was wrong to think that we could transition off fossil fuels to renewable, a renewable uh, powered society. I, 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 I used to work at WWF and I produced a report in 2007 celebrating the launch of Tesla Motors and saying this is evidence that we're all going to be driving electric cars and they're going to have electric dream futures and actually it's impossible, it's completely impossible because of the, the International Energy Agency has analysed the amount of rare earth metals and also things like lithium that we need to create the batteries to actually have a fully electric economy just for transport and household, not including heavy industry and agriculture. And they calculated you need between 700% and 4,000% increase of all these different metals. And those metals, unfortunately, are under the feet of indigenous peoples in the most pristine environments around the world. So just to help a few people in America and elsewhere drive some Teslas and feel good about themselves, we're going to destroy the last remaining wildernesses. Wow, that was great news to find out. So I, I am, um, yeah, so that was, um, so that was one thing. And then, and then I'm looking more into it as well, just the, the in incredible fossil fuel dependence of our way of life. The second thing was in climate science. Um, I didn't realize that actually those climate skeptics who said, it's all a hoax, actually in the past, when temperatures went up, like 100,000 years ago, then carbon dioxide increased two to four to 500 years later. So in the past, carbon didn't drive the heating, it amplified the heating. The thing is, climate skeptics therefore then say, so there's no carbon dioxide driven warming. That's illogical, there is, we know there is. It's, it's, it's a gas which traps infrared radiation so therefore, more carbon dioxide needs more warming. But what I didn't realize then is that it means that things are really bad already because, because we've already warmed the Earth up. So last se September just gone by, 1.8 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels, decades ahead of project past projections. That means there will be more carbon released from the biosphere. There's going to be loads more carbon coming from a hotter ocean released into the atmosphere. That's already going to happen no matter what we do. So actually I discovered it's actually way more depressing. And we're not in control. We can do lots of things to try and help, lots of good things to do, but we don't know what the future holds. It looks very scary. The third thing I didn't realize is that there's really good evidence that the hydro hydrological cycle matters massively and the amount of clouds matters, matters massively. And actually, the devastation of the world's forests that's happened over the last 200 years is possibly as important as the amount of carbon gases we put in the atmosphere because forests seed clouds through pollen and bacteria globally. So you'll have, a, you'll have pollen and bacteria from the Amazon actually seeding clouds in Tibet. This was through mainstream climatology, seen as a, as a minor localized effect, it's not. So what does that mean? That means that we should be doing a hell of a lot to repair, well, to protect and re regenerate forests and also promote agroforestry, so more, more, more trees mixed with, with our agriculture. So those were the things that really stood out for me because I thought I knew what I was talking about. You know, I'm a professional environmentalist for decades. But these things I had not paid attention to. I just assumed kind of what was the mainstream knowledge on them. I get the sense, um, having, having read the book and, and some of your personal reflection on this, that this could have been a very difficult book to write at times. Um, quite a few long dark nights of the soul and maybe a bit of personal collapsing and, and disintegration as well as positive disintegration along the way. So could you talk a little bit about the sort of the personal not just the personal toll it took me, but also that kind of um, the transformation that has has seen it as well. Nice easy question. Um, I couldn't approach doing this book unless it felt like a valedictory thing, like like this is it. I'm going to have a nicer life after this. So there were lots of nights or. 
working until 1 a.m. because I set myself deadlines to get chapters done. Um, I was looking back, it's a weird thing to say it, but I was lucky that I went back to the UK to spend time with my dad, who was bed bound with terminal cancer. So for over two months, it was just me in the lounge writing, then going and making him a cup of tea and watching a bit of TV with him, and then him saying, how's the book? How's the book? Imagine my dad on his deathbed, how's the book? <laughs> it's a bit of a motivating thing. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so, so that, was, that was pretty important. Also, Kraton works really well for you. Know, <laughs> so I, was, I, was, I think it wasn't criminalized at the time. So. So thanks, Dad, and thanks, Kraton. Um, but yeah, it was... I actually got very excited after I'd done the first half. It's like, okay, it's worse than I thought, and also there's good evidence that things have been breaking down since 2016. So it's not like it's inevitable, things are breaking down. It's a process, it's not some sort of sudden event. We don't know when the breakdowns will lurch forward and it will be that more of what we took for granted has gone. We, we don't know. But after I got over that, it was actually quite exciting to think about, well, what would be a, a new political philosophy, a new way of organising together in that reality? And I was excited by it because I saw two false narratives taking hold amongst my friends and colleagues. One was, technology will fix it, billionaires will fix it, governments will fix it, just keep working, keep saving, keep believing, keep hoping, and we'll get through this, humans always do. That narrative, it's the eco narrative. And then the other narrative, which has emerged and become very big over the last two years, which is, it's all a scam. The globalists are just trying to control you and make money, and it's never just, it doesn't exist. The fact that globalists have a bad agenda also means the problem itself doesn't exist. So these two narratives are becoming very dominant, and therefore I wanted to offer a, a narrative which I felt was more authentic for the people who were doing really good stuff at local levels. People doing regenerative farms, people doing local currency schemes, people relocalizing trade. Um, people ditching their careers and becoming spiritual guides or counsellors um, and doing amazing work of all kinds. And I thought, that's a people's environmentalism and we don't hear enough about it. We don't. Either the mainstream media will just keep telling you about Bill Gates and, and I don't know, new technologies and Tesla cars, and then the alternative media through Telegram will just keep sending you stupid videos from, you know, people from the oil industry recycling climate hoax products. And so I thought, you know, let's, let's offer... So I got quite excited about the potential of a different narrative, which would actually bring attention to the people doing amazing things already. Nice. And I think that, that goes to... I think you've done a good job of kind of like articulating the title breaking together, right? As an opposition to breaking apart. It's the idea that things are breaking, but it doesn't have to become isolated and atomized um, and, and fragments in that sense that new coalitions and new unities form from there. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about the, the fabulous cover art? And some of you may have noticed um, a resemblance between this cover art and some of the photos uh, on, on the wall. Um, and, and explain the, you know, the, the nifty uh, Japanese name for this and also maybe shout out to uh, the recap as well. Yeah, sure. So. Um, I think what, what these images are on the wall and what's on the cover is mainly because I just love working with Dorinka, so I just cooked <laughs> up an idea, like, let's do something funky for the cover. And once so the Dorinka's over there, you've got an amazing t-shirt on. We did the t-shirt together as well. It's, what does it say? Doomsters, grow our own food, make our own music, use our own currencies, and have more fun. <laughs> And that's the merchants for sale, of course. Oh, you can buy the t-shirts, yeah. Um, so, I... Yeah, so there's two bits of iconography on the cover. Uh, classic Greek, uh, ancient myth, and also Kintsugi, the Japanese practice of... So, has anyone heard of Kintsugi and Japan and what they do? It's, uh, 
basically it's something that you love, maybe the, a plate you used to always eat your porridge out of from the, as a kid and then your mum maybe made an heirloom in the family and it breaks and you stick it back together again with gold. It doesn't mean you use it again in the way you used to, but you've commemorated the whole experience around that object and you turned it into something beautiful and therefore it might just be on the mantelpiece now. That's the practice of Kintsugi. So you don't go back to what was, but you honour what was lost. You make something new and beautiful out of what was broken. And the Atlas myth is widely understood, uh, misunderstood. That's not the world on his back. That's not other people on his back. That's Zeus cursing uh, Atlas with the notion that unless he struggled to hold up the heavens and keep life in order, it would collapse and kill all life on Earth and, and his loved ones. Um, so for me, that, there's a paradox in that Greek myth that actually it's quite nice that humans care for each other in nature, and it's completely mad. Because we're not the center of the universe, we're not the center of life on Earth. And this can become delusional and destructive when we think it's all down to us. So this anthropocentrism, this centeredness about humans being in charge and needing control is the origin of so much destruction and has led us to this awful point. But we don't want to throw it all away. It's actually still nice for people to think about other people in nature. So the image there is that recognizing that that impulse has broken the world, but also there's something good in the impulse. How can we honor it? And, and learn from it and move forward. So that's in that. And then we did Kintsugi Everything. It's called the, the exhibition is called Kintsugi World. And so each chapter has an image. And it's not in the book, but I'm doing a little follow-up sort of coffee table book, which will have like each image and some, you know, just so, because I, I got this new idea of sort of subversion, so that if you do a coffee table book, just leave it sort of at the dentist's or, or in, you know, in the, uh, a Como resort opposite, just in, in the reception, and people open it. And say, it's like, what? The world's collapsing? <laughs> what happened to my Tesla? Why, why is my Tesla all mangled? Is it oh, it's a Tesla. Is it back there? Yeah. Do you know, so after I published that image of a Kintsugi Tesla, so basically a Tesla that's fallen into pieces and stuck back together again, which is basically to illustrate the idea that, that everyone's lying about net zero, it's not actually possible, and we need to power down societies, and so we can't just have rich people driving around in electric cars. It's not going to work. We need to drive less, we need to consume less, we need to change our whole way of life, basically, to reduce harm and get through this better. About a week after I published that, I was banned from Twitter without any explanation. <laughs> three months ago. And I appealed three times and nothing. So I'm sure it's got nothing to do with me pissing off Elon Musk. Yeah, I mean, weird choices like that. Happen. It's totally weird. It's totally weird. It's just a weird coincidence. Yeah. Story of my life. Um, I, I want to ask you, Jen, just a little bit to sort of like um, unpack the way that you're conceptualizing collapse in this book and maybe help um, the audience see it and recognize it in their own lives. So I sort of feel like, um, for myself personally, and maybe for a lot of you as well, there's sort of like that instantaneous sub dramatic collapse that you recognize from disaster movies or if you lived through a flood or a fire or a disaster where you're like, things were fine, then they were terrible, then they sort of got, or not quite as better, but sort of back to normal. And then there's this slower idea of the collapse of process that's like, things change over decades, centuries, you know, like there was a Roman Empire, then it collapsed. Um, but that's hard to see at a kind of speed of day to day. So I sort of feel like one of the really important things that your book is doing is giving people collapse literacy and, and that feels to sort of see collapse in the world, even if it's not always so obvious or immediate. So yeah, I talk about it in the book as the creeping collapse of modern societies everywhere. Basically, I, the first half of the book, I look at the foundational systems of modern societies energy and food and a healthy biosphere and a, cli a stable climate, but also the monetary system and the economic system. And I show how all those foundations are breaking. But what was also new to me after I did the research is I found there's very good data to suggest that the majority of modern societies on all populated continents have been breaking down since before 2016. So 90% countries have a declining 
Human Development Act uh, since uh, 2019. And um, because uh, OE, rich OECD countries have joined the decline by 2019, and some of the data in those indices is two years old. So this means that the decline could easily have been happening by 2017. And I'm talking about your rich countries, so-called rich countries, not just poor ones. So we all assume that, like you know, life is progressing. Um, we might, many of us do, um, but actually the data shows that there's been this systematic decline. And so in the book, I connect those cracks on the surface, as I call them, with these uh, cracks in the foundations. And because it's a, this is a global phenomenon, that points to the fact that it's a, you know, a global set of factors driving that. And, and I argue that this, it, it's a very credible conclusion that we're not going to fix this if you look at why it's happening. And I point to the fact that it's normalcy bias in a culture that assumes progress, that scientists will think, I am the one who has to keep defending myself when all I'm doing is extrapolating from existing trends. They're the ones who are doing magical thinking about technology and policy and everything changing overnight and fixing everything when it hasn't ever yet so far. But they can just say, oh, we'll fix it. And there's no falsifiable theory. You say, what data would prove you wrong when you say there's something going to fix this? The, the kind of scientists who've abandoned scientific method in order to avoid, the, the, understandably, to avoid the pain of being honest about the situation with themselves and each other and us. Um, so, I mean, the, in the second half of, half of the book, when you get into the what can should we do about it? There's a there's a lot of really fascinating stuff here, and I think oh, yeah, I just realised something. I didn't quite answer your question. I have just realised something. How are all you going to experience collapse? You were pointing at that, weren't you? Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Prices, basically. So other people who have suddenly you know got a third of their country underwater, or they lived in on the coast of Libya and got washed away into the sea, or my friend who lives in Greece and where his whole area where he lives has been trashed and they don't quite know how they're going to repair the agricultural systems there. That's um, a localised collapse. Um, but more broadly, for the lucky people like yourselves uh, who live here, if you're very lucky, if you're not so lucky and don't live here but still can get here, um, yeah, you, you, you're privileged. You, like me, you can, if if for some reason there's something not for sale in the supermarket because it's not made anymore because there was an environmental disaster in that area, you just buy something else from somewhere else. I mean, that, that we're super privileged at the moment. So but the way this is experienced at the moment by people who are privileged like us is through prices. Everything's going up and up and up. And only part of that is to do with stupid monetary policy. An increasing part of it is to do with the fact that the economies are hitting ecological limits, and also we've hit peak crude oil in 2015, and therefore all these things are flowing through and we experience them as, as prices. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. You also, uh, so inflation is not yeah. going to come down. It will continue to be about, it will hover and then it will go up. And food yes. inflation is way higher than the inflation in other things, so it's slightly masked. Yes. In so many countries in Europe, food inflation has been about 14, 15 percent, so higher than yes. uh, and for a few years. Yes. And then you, you talk in, in your book about the like, um, very real and essentially quite um, near term prospects of multiple bread basket failures, which can sound like quite anodyne, but if it's like um, wheat crops failing across multiple continents, <laughs> it's kind of a big deal, right? A lot of us eat wheat. So this is, this is key. A lot, a lot of people. This is the biggest, yes, so this is the, the, the most rapid way our lives could be super disrupted. Because the poles, North and South Pole, would be heating up more than the equator. And therefore that reduces the temperature gradient, which makes the jet stream less powerful. Therefore, like in a river, when a river gets all bendy, when it loses its energy, well, that's what happens with the jet stream. And when that happens, in some regions, it pulls down colder air. In other regions, it pulls up hotter air. And there's this blocking effect. And therefore, you get intense precipitation or you get intense droughts, longer and worse than previously. And the problem is, is that all the big grain-producing areas in the Northern Hemisphere 
can all be affected at the same time by this wavy jet stream. So Russia, Ukraine, um, uh, big parts of Europe, North America, uh, China, these the grain producing areas for wheat and maize and barley particularly could all be hit badly at the same time. And certain models predict that because of this impact of climate change on the jet stream, on extreme weather, in the northern hemisphere, that statistically speaking, a what's called a, a multi-spread basket failure. So a number of those key areas really important for exporting grains onto the international markets. Yeah, they could all be hit and experience about a 25% drop. And what happens is we've seen it, some of you may already know, that countries just ban exports. India, for example, just banned exports of rice and wheat a few weeks ago. This is what happens. And so I am far happier living in a country and living my way of life where I'm getting closer to food. I'm getting closer to the farmers. I actually now, every time I go to a big Western city, my body feels nervous. I know things could snap overnight because I know these, the, the, the way of life is entirely dependent on incredibly extended complex supply chains and they're all under stress and they could all snap at any point. So I'm far happier living closer to farmers and closer to food. And, and just, just, just for people who aren't aware of, of exactly how close to farmers and how close to food you are, do you want to just um, tell us all about, you know, now that you're sort of transitioning away from academia, what, what kind of farming are you doing this at the road? So there are loads of ways people are responding to their sense that things are breaking down and I don't want to be prescriptive. So what I've always said is take your time. You know, you may decide that what was in your heart was to be a musician or to be a Buddhist monk or to set up an orphanage or to, if you're really smart, adopt 20 cats, you know. Um, whatever's in your heart, do it, yeah. That's, for me, that's the big thing with realizing, oh, this idea that everything is stable and will continue and we'll have the conveniences and capabilities we do today Realizing that's not the case, that really invites you to think, well, what do I, what's in my heart, what do I want to do? And another thing that happens is, totally understandable, is a little bit of survivalism. <laughs> a little bit of, okay, what do I want to do that I love, but also, how can I kind of, and wouldn't it be stupid that I write a book about this and then I'm one of the first ones to die? You know, it just seems a bit, a bit stupid. So, be good for sales, Jim. Don't do that. <laughs> so I, I decided um, I wanted, it would be lovely to do a regenerative farm. Uh, it would be lovely to actually, you know, to make food in a way which is non-toxic and which restores biodiversity and do it in partnership with the community. And then, of course, that's all a bit, still a little bit preppery. So actually what would be much better is to do an organic and regenerative farm school. So we're going to focus on Balinese smallholders and how we help them to go back to, maybe to go back to the methods they used to use, but using some of the local, uh, some of the latest innovations and the people who know about syntropic agriculture, agroforestry, permaculture. So I, one of my members of my research team, Papillon, who's here tonight, um, uh, he was, He'll say so himself, I think, but I'm going to speak for you, Papillon. Um, uh, he only worked with me on this book because he wanted the money. <laughs> what he really wants to be doing is, is um, growing things in ways where suddenly there would be wasp nests in them. And he, I, he, I still remember the day where he pointed to a banana plant with a wasp's nest and he looked so happy. I was like, ooh, and he said, oh great, this biodiversity is coming back. And, so we work together and he's, he's helping advise on, on how to do that. We're doing it in partnership with an NGO called MS Hitap. We've got a lot of experience in working with Balinese and Indonesians in regenerative farming. And um, yeah, so I'm, I'm basically just an observer and a champion of the project. That's it. I, I don't get my hands dirty. Uh, I mean, Indonesia doesn't need a, a white foreign farm laborer. There's quite a lot of staff here for that. <laughs> No offense to any of the white um, neighbors in the room. Um, could, could I ask you as well, if you've, there are a couple of things that you've mentioned here in terms of like um, majority world countries potentially suddenly stopping exports. Um, and then also the idea of kind of empowering youth and empowering the, the young generation. 
And some of that can come together in this term um, you use, which is neo-protectionism. Um, <laughs> what could that mean? When I hear, heard you talk about it, it's like, that sounds pretty radical. It's something I would like to get behind. But it's like, it's not exactly being discussed in um, mainstream discourse at the moment. Yeah, so has anyone here heard of the degrowth? Yeah, so there's quite a lot of people now, intellectuals in the West, particularly in Europe, when they realize the limitations of the story of transitioning to renewables and living like we do today, they then think, yeah, okay, we need to contract the economy consciously, we need to degrow the consumption of resources. And they come up with all these ideas about how that might be done voluntarily. I think that's so silly. They think that they're going to have a politician win an election by saying, I'm going to make you all a bit poorer, but you'll be happy. Okay. And, and, and even if they won that election and did that, wouldn't there be a massive backlash, particularly with the incredible cost of living crisis already and the amount of inequality and the amount of anger about the amount of inequality? So, no, I don't think it's going to happen. Um, at the moment, the way many people live is dependent on exploitative international trade relationships and financial relationships, which are a legacy and inherited from colonial relationships. So um, I believe that there is already beginning a, a, a rise in anti-imperialism in many parts of the so-called majority world. The famous bits of West Africa with the revolutions that are occurring, but that's only one manifestation. There's big movements now, campaigns against French multinationals in French speak Francophone Africa. It's been ongoing for about five years. And within that, there is a new sentiment around environmental damage, climate change, looking toward a very disturbed future. And we didn't make this problem. Like so many of the poor pe or poorer people in the majority of the world aren't the ones that created this problem. So, in like the polite world that I used to live in, when I used to be polite in um, in, in in Western Green Town, you don't want to talk about like blame and shame, and you don't want to talk about what like the poor people in hot countries will start to blame us for destroying their futures, and they might therefore not want to export cheap goods. And, to us, like, let's just, let's just talk about something else. However, <coughs> more people are beginning to realize that this might actually be the way that there can be external pressure for the richer countries to degrow. And within that context, there will be legitimate demands for more equal redistribution of the smaller amount of resources that are in, say, my country, Britain. Um, so yeah, I, I, I talk about it a bit in the book, I even talked about it in the Novara Media podcast, but also it's, it's some, of the some of the founder members of Extinction Rebellion are talking this way as well. They're realizing that if we're going to do anything to help this predicament, those of us in the West need to move into more active solidarity with people in political movements in the global South. Excellent. Um, this, I hope you get the sense that, well, this is some pretty heavy stuff, that um, gems are... Should I frank some jokes? Yeah, yeah, well, I mean, you, you are a funny guy, and there actually are a lot of very funny lines in this book, and I think, I think one of the things that, um, you know, makes it such an interesting, unique read is that there's, there's a whole lot of, like, very, you know, dense, well-researched scholarship, but then you break the frame, and, like, there's some very sick burns. Um, to a number of different people, and some like very witty and kind of like um, cheeky terms of phrase. So I thought I might just read a couple of key sentences, and then if you wouldn't mind treating the audience to a reading for a couple of minutes, and then we'll throw the audience questions. Um, so so this, is just, this is just a small sample. Um, I never responded well to wild lad preachers. And just because the preachers of the progress religion happen to work in business, charity, or academia doesn't make them more of um, And then Whereas aging hipsters might find that making smash everyone's post at home will soon cost more than it did in a cafe, today's doomsters like to grow their own avocados. And then if I can get to that page, this is a, this is a sick burn on Davos. Davos. Oh, Davos. Apologies. I've never been, so I'm not sure how. Where get this pronunciation? No one will take you seriously. 
What I didn't realize is the one thing worse than the world that needs not taking climate change seriously would be them taking climate change seriously. Uh, so with that, uh, would you be up for giving a, a short reading? Yeah, and then we go to questions, is that right? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, when, when Tom asked me to do a reading, I, I, I didn't, I couldn't face it all again and choosing what to do. So, <laughs> I, uh, I, this is uh, something that I read to my dad in hospice. Because um, uh, it's kind of not so depressing, this bit. Um, it might have been the Reverend's trifle particularly the sloshings of sherry under his lashings of cream. Or perhaps it was those first glasses of red wine after three years, all tasted great after a day of Cumbrian air. But I also remember keeping my head down beneath my knees before sliding down onto the floor and rolling onto my side. Get some cushions and a blanket, the Reverend said to the other guests. The rest is a bit of a blur, but I recall the pleasantness of lying on an ancient tiled floor, feeling embarrassed about spoiling my friend's dinner, and this calm, matter-of-fact demeanor of my host as he checked my vital signs. Collapsing under Reverend Stephen Wright's dining table was full of surprises. Within about half an hour, I was back on my chair, staring at what was left of the extreme trifle to see if my nausea had passed. Stephen's calm checking of everything and sending our worried looking friends away with tasks were the acts of a nurse with decades of experience. A palliative nurse, in fact. So I was in good hands if things took a turn for the worse. After an episode like that, the inquest begins. Even as the cheese board came out, I was listening to Stephen about the vagal nerve and how it can shut down, shut us down when too exhausted, especially when eating a lot. In this case, I was finally taking a moment out of the rush and gaining some perspective on my situation, and the body said no. Put a line through anything you don't absolutely need to do in the coming months, said Stephen. Simplify things and prioritize your self-care. I took him seriously. So seriously that I even watched Queen Elizabeth documentaries in the afternoon. Yeah, I mean more than one. I was a bit rattled. Nevertheless, the following week I climbed up Bank Blaine Cathra, the closest mountain to the Reverend's nicely tiled floor, because I wanted to feel alive in nature again, not stifled and, and, and defensive in front of my laptop, calculating how much bad there was in the world. Before arriving at Reverend Wright's cottage for the weekend, my day job for the previous 18 months had been researching the most worrying stuff anyone could research. Not just the natural science on ecology, energy and climate, but related fields in economics, politics, philosophy and more. What I learned with colleagues in those 18 months worsened my initial hypothesis. It removed many of the things I still felt positive about. And despite the promises I made myself, start it didn't remain a day job. The collapse of our way of life is rather all-encompassing topic. It touches everything. So what should I say in a book? What should I leave out? Why are so few people saying it? Why so many journalists attack people like me for saying just some bits of it? How could I share ideas into a public space that had become so hostile to non-conformism? And as I'm identifying problems, people will expect answers on everything under the sun. Otherwise, I'll be seen as negative, defeatist, pointless, and disgusting. I wanted to share some ideas, as I don't want my analysis to accidentally energize those whose good ideas I do not support. I wanted if offering a framework for talking about these ideas would be enough, like I'd done with deep adaptation five years earlier. I had all these questions and more bothering me 24-7 as I delayed beginning writing the book until I knew exactly what might be worth saying. And I dreaded the choice I already felt compelled to make, to spend the next nine months writing a detailed synthesis of evidence on the unfolding collapse of modern societies and my analysis of why this is happening and how to react. People wouldn't like it, I thought. They'll reject it, including people who previously welcomed my work. I would have spoiled 
years of my life when I could have been enjoying music and farming. And so I had my personal collapse. In the big scheme of things, a rather trifling matter. Boom, boom. But it showed me I needed to put a red line through lots of things, which I did. I put a red line through the ideas that this book, would, other than reporting on what I had found and is the situation, why I believe it's occurred, and what is an important philosophy for our response. I put a red line through the hope this book would become a bestseller. Um, no, Chris. Or that I'd avoid vilification. I, bought, I put a red line through most of my leisure plans for the coming nine months. Instead, this writing was going to be my cross to bear. I reluctantly accepted the necessity of returning to the combative world of scientific analysis and dissemination, because that way of being was something I'd begun to leave behind after my previous deep dive into scholarship on the state of the world in 2017-2018. That smart guy with the intellectual contribution to make was an identity I had now begun to pathologize as an addiction, but I was going to be back in that role deeply and for the foreseeable. For the foreseeable. I'm writing these lines in March 2023, and the light at the end of the tunnel is distracting. Because I already know what kind of life one can lead once embracing the kind of analysis in this book. It's not the kind of life spent refining one's academic arguments. It's a life of greater freedom to follow your passions. In this chapter, I want to share with you some examples of people who've been transformed by concluding that modern societies will collapse. I want to share how they then pursue activities which relate to the eco-libertarian ethic I described in the last chapter. And in so doing, I will point to some of the areas of partial responses, not answers or solutions, to the predicament that I have outlined in this book. Thanks very much, Jim. Jim Tamakasi. So um, this will be the roving mic now. So I guess, um, are, you, are you happy to drive that? So I guess just hands up. Usually I'd be quite a strict father and I'd be like, we're after questions, not comments. And you know how you tell the difference between a question and a comment is that at the end of a question, your voice goes up. And the comment goes on for quite a long time. But Jim actually said he was quite open to comment questions. So, so let's just go for it. Yeah. All right, thank you, Kalija. My name is Dan, former journalist for Vice at CIP, um, currently working as a marketer. So I actually have a couple of questions for you. So you mentioned earlier that you moved to Bali to start a regenerative farm. Yes. Uh, why did you specifically select Kapatiri? And uh, uh, I just want to bring a local perspective here because I am based in Jakarta. I, I noticed that a lot of the faces in the room are not local um, and very privileged, I would assume. So. Uh, what are you doing in your farm, I guess, to combat the narrative of, say, colonialism or imperialism or, and not repeating the mistakes of people past? Fantastic question. Thank you. I'm very aware of this issue of privilege. Now, privilege is always relative. Um, Meaning, obviously, there's, there's gradations. And so, in the UK, uh, because I was an activist for so long and um, didn't buy a house when I was young, and I, I didn't have the opportunities in the UK to even consider doing a farm. I would have had to borrow millions, and maybe they wouldn't have even lent it to me, and that would have been a big stressor, and it would have sh shaped the project to be all about paying back the debt. Also in the UK, it's not very normal to lease land long term. It's really all about freehold. Um, so here in Indonesia, I've, I've um, signed a lease for 15 years from a family just outside Tampak City for about a third of their spare land, 3,000 square meters. So it's a small demonstration park. And our intention is to work with local Yayasans to help promote the restoration of Balinese farming practices that have been overridden by the Green Revolution, so foreign influence. So it's not like Bali exists without foreign influence over the last decades. There's been a trashing of Balinese environment because of foreign influence, whether that's tourism or just through agricultural extension projects through the Green Revolution. So, 
it needs to be done in partnership. We are very much conscious of trying to make sure that uh, the temple, the bancha, the subak, everyone, you know, we talk to everyone and we're doing everything with them. We're really just investors and advisors. And in my case, with the actual, the way the numbers work, in terms of you don't make much money for a small holding like that, it's almost like a tiny holding. Um, I, I have to accept it's more like philanthropy. I'm never going to see my money back. <laughs> so, so um, but to do the dream of a proper um, farm school, um, I have to raise philanthropic money to, to, to do that. Um, because my dream is to not just train local small holding families, but actually do projects with uh, school children across Bali um, to then, to the, if there's a demand, I would love that, to then teach them these methods and then more like, like use the focus on regenerative and organic farming to stimulate conversations about what is progress, what is a contemporary way of honouring and living Balinese culture in terms of re relationships with the divine, with nature, with each other and with self, you know, to just to stimulate that. Would be, would be a wonderful way for me to spend my time here. I chose Bali because I was already here. I came here a few years ago because I love it. And, um, but also because it's got gravity-fed irrigation, fertile volcanic soils, year-round growing season. Uh, it's got a population where the families are all smallholders and therefore can actually, if there's an economic disaster, as they've had, they can all actually go back to feeding themselves. Uh, and as climate change gets worse, you mentioned why Tampax Well, where the farm is, it's 300 metres from. So right now, you're a bit hot. Imagine it being three degrees cooler. So I was a deliberate choice to be starting this farm where it would be a bit cooler because I'm anticipating it getting hotter. Um, these are, these are my, I, I'm a bit conscious about whether I'm just being defensive on an individual level. So what I want to say is, I, I believe my answer is not enough. I want to hear from you and I want to hear from people who really don't want a neo-colonial thing going on to hear what we should be doing. Because I'm just doing my little thing and trying not to be colonialist about it, but you tell me and other people here who've got ideas about what I can do to help being more non-colonial, more anti-imperialist, I'm all ears. Thank you for the wonderful answer. Um, yeah, no, no, there's, I totally agree and I understand your point. Um, I understand that um, Tom Brexit is about the community store, but there are other cooler areas in Bali too. Like for example, Manubo. I, I used to work at a farm table restaurant that actually worked with small small farms in Manubo. So I want to talk to you after that. <laughs> love to. Yes, and that's part as well. So, yeah, why? Why, come uh, why? Because we wanted to be able to get there driving. So it's 45 minutes for me and uh, half an hour from my, my business partner. Um, and our staff as well, we've got two staff, well one of them lives in the woods, so we wanted somewhere that we could still get to, for now. Um, but also in Tampax Syrian there's a broader range of things than we can grow if we were, say, in Redigal. Also because Emma's Hitam encouraged us to go there. So Emma's Hitam has managed to get 27 families in Kedisan to convert to organics. So the idea is we're hoping that we're, we're doing it there in Tampax Syrian with Emma's Hitam, Success would be in a few years, 20 odd families, smallholders in that area would convert to organic farming. Um, that, that, that was the other reason. You took their advice. A lot of trend lines in sciences and economics and other disciplines show ups and downs. Given that we've recently had a pandemic, an economic, displacement, if you like, that may or may not be truly related, and significant wars going on, how can you be sure that the downturn in many of the world's economies are not just a reaction to these events as opposed to the beginning of global economic collapse? Yeah, thanks. So, um, in chapter one of my book, I use 
the, the biggest data sets that I could get my hands on and my colleagues could get their hands on, Human Development Index, UN reports on progress to the Sustainable Development Goals, the Numbio Quality of Life Index, and so we crunched the numbers and things like life expectancy, literacy, disease burden, all these indicators are going in the wrong way in the majority of countries, non-OECD, majority of non-OECD countries since 2016. So there's been a widespread decline in super basic indicators of standard of living and quality of life since 2016. And in OECD countries, the majority of OECD countries since 2019, and when you look at the details, like the footnotes, you get really geeky about it. So, like, oh, quite a lot of this data is even two years old before they published the official stats. So, I talk about it in the book. I talk about it as there's probably a picture you can find online of the world leaders on stage in New York, in the UN in 2015, all announcing their 2030 sustainable development goals. And, um, for the majority of leaders on that stage, their societies had already begun their steady decline when they signed that. So, um, yes, I agree with you. There are there are there are setbacks which we can recover from. So collapse, I see collapse more like um, a staircase, but where the the steps in the staircase are not flat; they're actually tilted back up. So you go down and then a little bit up, down and a little bit up. And down. So it's going to be like that. And there are actually scholars who look at societal collapse and try and actually map that. There are scholars who look at eco ecosystem collapse and try and show that too. So um, if, you're, if, you, if you're into that, I got really into it. I, I geeked out on some of this stuff. So there's some good geeky stuff in the book in chapters one and four on, on how you see collapse in, in data sets. Thanks. It's, it's not a question, it's a comment to, to add to that. You mentioned um, the pandemic, you mentioned the wars, and I know from, yeah, from the perspective that Jem's explored in his book, they themselves are indicators of cups, indicators of the cups of public security, of democracy, uh, yeah, ecosystem collapse, which is, um, yeah, implicated in the in the pandemic. Oh. Thank you. Yeah, there is this um, whether or not COVID nineteen was engineered, deforestation and climate change together increases the likelihood of so called zoonotic spillover of disease. Like loads of people I know in the UK got Lyme's disease. And no, when I was a kid, no one got Lyme's disease. And, and also the medical doctors, when my mum was going back to the doctor in agony for weeks, well, you can't have Lyme's disease. You're only gardening in your back garden. That's impossible. And it had to be me and my brother faxing the GP to say, unless you test my mum for Lyme's disease, we're holding you responsible. And we think you should do a uh, presumptive prescription of, I think it was uh, doxycycline. And then when the, when the results came back from Port and Down, Lyme's disease. So my mum had two weeks of bad, like, and real nasty neurological damage because a GP refused to think that, well, we don't have Lyme's disease until you talk about your garden. So that's an example of how understanding is not catching up. So there's not this adaptation at that level to understand the kind of diseases that are spreading because of climate change. Hi, uh, thanks, sorry, thanks for your talk today. Um, sustainability has always been a catchword for me. It's always drawn me to read more. But now I'm confused by the word sustainable. I'm just wondering if you could give me what your definition of sustainability is now. The first thing that came to mind is 
is is your worldview, is your sense of reality and yourself in relation to reality tenable, <laughs> like sustainable? Um, okay. If sustainability is meant to mean the longevity of a human society, where the longevity is is in harmony with not trashing the biosphere, because it, you can't have a, a society that's long term with that, then sustainability was the general condition of many indigenous societies and ancient societies. Uh, lots of them collapsed, but lots of them learned from collapse. And also the history of civilizational collapse tends to focus on urban societies, when actually there were very complex societies just living in the forest and staying there and had no interest in actually moving into cities. So those were sustainable. We wouldn't be here to get it today, would we? Homo sapiens wouldn't exist unless we'd actually managed to, <coughs> to find a way to get here through myth hundreds of thousands of years. But if you want me to be precise about point to something somewhere <coughs> that community is sustainable, I find it very difficult to do that now. Um, and the main reason for that is because we don't know how fast the climate change is going to be. So you could have a wonderful you know, circular economy, regenerating, regenerating the soils, not relying on foreign supply chains, uh, getting wasps back into <laughs> whatever, and then and then suddenly uh, it doesn't rain in Bali for five years at all, for example, and then you know, game over. So I'm not motivated by sustainability. I'm motivated about doing beautiful, lovely things with each other and in nature. And if it helps, it helps. And if it lasts, it lasts. But I, I, I don't find sustainability as a use. I, I tend to work regenerative, use the word resilient and regenerative words resilient and regenerative now. So but if someone can understand. answer this question better than me, I just am so alienated from the sustainability <laughs> term. I'm a professor. Oh no, I'm an emeritus professor now. Do I have an emeritus professor of sustainability? So if I understand you, you say it's sustainable park. We need to find a sustainable place and park. Space. Yes, a sustainable place to live in terms of our heart, which therefore means to be fully, as much as we'll ever know we can be, uh, adjusted to our mortality and the mortality of all those we love and the, modern, and the ultimate disappearance of anything we can have any legacy over. Just be okay with impermanence. If you're okay with impermanence, then that can't not be sustainable. <laughs> Uh, thanks, Jim. This is a more macro question, I guess. Uh, you talk about the need for massive reforestation uh, to combat the issues with the, the city the clouds, uh, talking about degrowth uh, from the, the major economies. These things are unlikely to occur by themselves without some sort of government leadership. So I'm interested to hear if you think democracy is up to that challenge. And if democracy isn't, what will be required? So we don't live in a democracy, we live in a corporate autocracy. We are all uh, under the tyranny of global finance and it's an entire illusion that there's any democracy. <laughs> Elaborate. Um, I believe. I believe in the human race. I believe in you, I believe in me, I believe in it. Uh, let's look at everyone. We're all, oh, I was about to swear. Uh, we're all, we're all delightful, loving humans who want to do good in the world, but we've grown up in a system that makes ourselves feel insecure, competitive, that, that makes us numb to the pain of the other life forms and other humans that suffer because of the way the systems are. That's all coming from an expansionist monetary system that creates demands on corporations and states. The bond markets rule government policy. Um, we can't have a stable 
state economy where the expansion is monetary system because then as debts get paid off, the money disappears and suddenly we can't transact with each other. It's called unemployment, it's called recession, it's called bankruptcy. So we are not free. A big message of my book is that it's not human freedoms that led to this crisis, it's our unfreedom, the fact that we have been coerced and manipulated and rewarded for behaving in certain ways, not others. Now, of course, some people can say that's naive, but that means you're choosing to see human nature a particular way, and we have no evidence, we have little evidence, of how humans would live outside of what I call imperial modernity with an expansionist monetary system in industrial consumer societies. Um, we do actually have some evidence of how indigenous people have lived. Um, so yeah, we, we do have evidence that our ancient societies actually lived in harmony. We now have evidence that this attitude that ancient societies all trash their environments and therefore somehow humans are necessarily bad for, for other life, that's actually purely racist anthropology and archaeology. The most latest analysis shows there was incredible positive relationships between ancient humans and current indigenous humans with nature. For example, the Amazon is not wild. The thousands of species, according to some studies, in the Amazon are entirely because of millennia of human settlement working to encourage biodiversity in the Amazon. So we were a wild gardening species before we became an agricultural one. So I mean, there's a whole big thing in my book about restoring that pride and love of being a human and how that's all been trashed by living in the society we have. So democracy, we're not in democracy. We need to reimagine what democracy means. I actually think that the state and the corporation will continue to crumble and therefore we need to turn to each other and we need to build from below. But I totally understand people who say no, we also must have tactics for taking some more power at government level and governmental power level. I appreciate that. That used to be my bag. It used to be, I used to work at the UN, it used to be all, but now I'm just exhausted with all that. So I'm more interested in turning to my neighbour and saying, what can we do locally to improve things? Um, but with a political consciousness. Can I just say that's a really good summary of eco-libertarianism, which is, which is uh, another of your terms that you use. One question. Uh, first, thank you so much for writing this book because you've put on paper something I've been recognizing my entire career but I couldn't possibly bring myself to write down. Um, so thank you. Uh, I was wondering if you had any ideas about along the lines of what I've been for my life causing, calling a crisis of values. Is there any way, and I understand you know about the term crisis, sorry. Um, so, is there any way that you think we can address the values that we have to change the, um, I guess, trajectory we're choosing? Well, thank you for the thanks. For those of you, I know buying a book is just one step to doing something like, you know, like joining a gym. So you've actually got to read the thing. So there we are. Someone who's read, read it, yeah, and 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 then well, it, it, see, see, it's good to read it. So those of you who bought it, don't just leave it on the shelf. Read it, and um, and then if you're troubled by it, then you might want to talk to other people about it. And so I recommend the Deep Adaptation Forum, which is deepadaptation.info, and then you can talk to people who are on a similar journey to which you might be on, trying to find a new way of being in the world. And therefore, that has to start with rethinking, checking in on what's most important to me. So this term, values. So I'm choosing to respond to your question by first, let's just have, give ourselves time and space to think about what are my values, and therefore, if I no longer believe the future is going to be as it is today, then, and things are going to get really tough, and uh, uh, we don't know how tough, how fast, but like, how do I want to be in that situation? What's important to me? Um, and that, I think, 
takes um, personal private reflection, but also it helps to be in dialogue with others. In that dialogue with others, then you're adding to something with ripple effects. How to change something more at scale. Okay. It's coming no matter what we do. This strange dividend of societal collapse is that we're going to see a lot more of all aspects of humanity, the bad and the good. Some people will respond with ego defense, ego affirmation. Some people will respond with ego transcendence, like you know, being, being broken open by their grief, being broken open by the full weight of the situation and wanting to be loving and kind. And all of it's going to happen. So I think like we don't necessarily have to be super tactical and strategic. It's almost like these things are coming to us. Conversations with friends, family, neighbors, colleagues. So as long as you're trying to be mindful and like choose conscious how you wish to be the calm in the storm in future, then, then opportunities will arise. And I'm all ears for how we sort of do something more at scale, and obviously, therefore, we could start thinking about how to get religious institutions to take this on. That was going to be my next project, if I could stand sitting in front of my laptop for another few years, would be to work with interfaith communities on how to integrate this awareness in what they do. Um, I'm not going to do that, but I think that's really important work if you want to think about having these conversations at scale, then some of the institutions to work through obviously will be religious institutions. Thank you. Um, one of your, the chapters in your book is about critical wisdom, and um, I haven't heard you talk about that yet, I'd like to, and maybe particularly in um, yeah, why it's such a strong call from you, and particularly in the context of how imperial modernity needs us to not have critical wisdom. Yeah, so although the book reading I did is kind of approachable, the book is also a bit heavy and scholarly in places. So there's a chapter where I'm, I'm a sociologist and I draw on my sociological training. And, and that's where I talk about the need for critical wisdom. Okay. Um, because of the predicament, I believe, we're facing. Excuse me. Our whole worldview and identity will be challenged. What we used to esteem, what we used to assume, what we used to look up to. The institutions we used to trust, whether that's like, I don't know, the CDC or BBC or whatever. All of this will be challenged. How do we navigate? How do we find meaning? How do we know what's true, what's wise, what's good? If we're losing our bearings in a world that's breaking down and with it all the certainties that we had before breaking down with it. There is a real possibility for a complete derangement, manipulation and therefore ultimately us turning on each other. And there are also institutions of power that want us to turn on each other because that means we won't turn on them. So therefore, I think it's really important that we try and develop what I call our critical wisdom. So it's one thing to talk about wanting to be loving and kind and the calm in the storm. But if we say that, and then we spend our lives watching CNN, it's probably going to be quite difficult. So critical wisdom is three, uh, four parts to it. The, the really simple ones, mindfulness, so disaggregating this 
complex of where stimuli, thought, feeling, thought, choice, communicate. There's, there's so much that goes in, in on in milliseconds inside of us with a stimuli, whether we choose to reject an idea or adopt it. And that's to do with our mind states and our cravings to affirm our ego and our current story or not. We need to become more aware of that, just to notice that, oh, we're pushing away an idea or we're grabbing an idea. Why? So just become a bit more of a watcher, mindfulness. Um, I also talk about rationality. Um, we don't want to chuck out rationality with everything else. We need to be good at logic and we'll be aware of logical fallacies. We need to apply our critical thinking in a logical sense. Um, intuition. There are different views. This is the third thing. Intuition. Different views on what intuition is. It could be the subconscious complex processing and multiple, multiple stimuli and pattern recognition and pattern disruption recognition. That's one view. Or it could be the fact, an aspect of us which is a sixth, then somewhat telepathic and, collect, and connected to a collective unconscious or an Akashic field and transpersonal, we space, understanding, or even universal consciousness. You can, we're in a boat. You can take the latter view if you want. A lot of people do. Um, and there are ways to cultivate that. For example, just emptying the mind and, and connecting with nature and suddenly you get some wisdom. You get an insight, you get a clarity. Did that come from the tree? <coughs> I'm not joking. I guess it's easy to joke. I'm not joking. But it may well have come from the tree, or from inside you, who knows? But the fourth thing that I really bang on about in the book is called critical literacy, and it's to understand how we don't think our own thoughts, we think culture's thoughts. Yeah. So, um, we need to be aware of how framing works, and narrative works, and discourse works, and how that's shaping us and making us conform. And, and then if we have that critical faculty and recognizing how the way things are told to us is actually serving some people and power, not others, maybe disabling our possibility for action. Um, if we don't have an awareness of that, then we're not going to be free to choose wisely as things get more troubling. So I, I talk about that in the book. Katie, if you want to give an example of critical literacy in action, go for it. <laughs> you have one more question in the mic. Um, hi, yeah, thanks. Uh, so my question, I want to come back to the um, to how you don't really believe in like um, governments or like larger institutions, and the response seems to be um, very you know going going back to the individual and just uh, adapting to things. But um, my question would be, what if we wanted to you know what if we wanted to be kind and compassionate and loving and like help others, but those larger institutions prevent us from doing so? For example, um, we know that um, for a fact that there will be millions or even billions of like climate refugees uh, around the world, right? Uh, but then we can't really do anything as an individual if, we, if, they, if they can't enter the country, and that's like not really our call. Yeah. So what would be your response to that? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, I didn't want to give the wrong impression. So my main aim for the second half of this book is to elaborate on a political philosophy of solidarity for an age of collapse. And that was because I thought that the right wing have, they've got their nostalgia politics, let's put the clock back, let's vote for the dictator's son, let's, you know, take back control, let's make America great again. It's all nostalgia politics. The center and the left doesn't seem to know what the hell to do in terms of uh, the fact that people are sensing that there's not progress anymore. They still call themselves progressives. Um, so I wanted to offer um, a political philosophy and framework for solidarity-based politics in an age of crimes. I, therefore, am, like all good left libertarians, I am therefore anti-authoritarian, and therefore I am anti-government institutions as they exist today. I'm anti the charade of democracy as it exists today. I am anti the, the direction of the intergovernmental agencies. I used to work in them. 
but I see how they've completely become wedded to global corporate interests, and I'm scared of what they're going to do next. So I'm comfortable being in opposition to state authority because I see there's a corrupt merger of state authority with global corporate power. My choice is to encourage that we turn to each other to build from below, but not stay below. So it is actually an explicitly revolutionary sentiment, but we've got to, we've got to look after each other first. Because more people are not going to get anything from either the mainstream market economy or help from the government. That's all going to break over time, or it is, but it will over time. So we need to work with each other more. Um, that's my philosophy. Um, and I don't demand that other people share that philosophy. Other people can try and do more with government right now. I mean, if, if nobody was trying to campaign to change government policy on refugees, I would probably want to do it. If nobody was trying to you know, get some good renewables energy policies in government level, I would probably want to do it, but I, I'm cho choosing to put my attention elsewhere. So if you're doing this other stuff, keep going for it. But what I'm saying is don't, what I'm inviting you to think is that maybe you might be being motivated by some stories about the future which are no longer valid. Yes. So to really reconsider that. And you might find that makes you even more radical, or it might mean that you just stay exactly as you are. Perfect. It's a great question, great answer. We've got it.